Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Legal Bites newscast. We decided last week to try out this new format and to see what people thought, and the feedback we got was overwhelmingly positive. Thanks to everyone who commented on the last one. We really, really appreciated every single one of your comments. Based on the responses, we'll try to keep this to a once a week update by taking interesting things that come up in the law and then giving them a quick rundown. And on that note, if you want to see more of a deep dive on any of the topics we mentioned here, let us know in the comments. We may be able to tease out a full video on it if there's enough interest. Okay, let's get into it. So the Supreme Court nomination process for Judge Amy Coney Barrett moved forward this week. The Senate Judiciary Committee voted on October 22nd to advance the nomination of Judge Barrett. As anyone remotely following this issue knows, there's been an intense fight between Republicans and Democrats over the nomination ever since the death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg in September. In the October 22nd vote, all 12 Republicans on the Senate Judiciary Committee voted to move ahead to a full Senate vote, while all 10 Democrats boycotted the vote. The next day, which was Friday, Senate Democrats forced the Senate to go into a rare closed-door session, which lasted about 20 minutes. Politico reports that the Senate hasn't held a closed-door session in more than a decade, and that Senate Democrats made this move on Friday in an effort to stall setting up a key procedural vote. Anyway, despite those efforts, the Senate ended up voting on whether to move the Senate into an executive session to allow Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell to expedite the final confirmation vote. Senators, for the most part, voted along party lines, with Democrats voting against advancement and Republicans voting for advancement to a full vote. The only exceptions appear to be Republican Senator Susan Collins of Maine and Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, who both voted against advancement of the vote. Senator Collins is in a tough re-election campaign in Maine for her seat this election cycle. And Senator Murkowski is expected to run in 2022 with opposition as well. So it seems both are trying to distance themselves from President Trump. Both senators have said before that they oppose the nomination of a new Supreme Court justice until after the election. Although it's unclear whether Senator Murkowski will vote for or against Judge Barrett's final confirmation. Despite their votes against advancement, there were enough votes to move forward with the nomination. And so the final Senate confirmation vote is expected to occur as early as this Monday. In the tech world, the Justice Department and a long list of individual states filed an antitrust lawsuit against Google, alleging that Google uses anti-competitive tactics to preserve a monopoly for its flagship search engine and related advertising business. This lawsuit has long been expected by many, and according to the Wall Street Journal, it's the most aggressive U.S. legal challenge to a company's dominance in the tech sector in more than two decades. The DOJ's complaint alleges that Google is illegally maintaining its monopoly in search engines through exclusionary contracts with distributors like mobile phone makers, wireless carriers, and web browsers in order to make Google their default search engine. These agreements allegedly involve Google paying out billions of dollars to distributors each year. The complaint further alleges that as a result of these agreements, Google owns or controls search distribution channels accounting for 80% of the general search queries in the US. In a statement in response, Google's chief legal officer said that the lawsuit was flawed and that consumers use Google because they choose to, not because they're forced or lack alternatives. I mean, that basically sounds like exactly what you'd expect an antitrust defendant to stay in this kind of a case. And also, if you're a regular viewer of our videos on this channel, you're probably familiar with another recently filed antitrust lawsuit against Google, which was filed by Epic Games in August after Google banned the popular video game Fortnite from the Google Play Store. So if you're tracking, you probably recognize these claims by the DOJ against Google because they're actually very similar to the claims made by Epic Games against Google for Google's alleged monopolization of the App Store market and the in-app payment processing market. It'll be really interesting to see how this case develops, especially in tandem with the Epic Games lawsuit against Google as well. In the fashion world, on October 14th, Nike filed a lawsuit against Los Angeles-based brand Warren Lotus after Warren Lotus unveiled what it called a reinterpretation of the cult classic shoe that supposedly catapulted sneaker culture to the masses back in 2005. The Warren Lotus sneakers are apparently a result of a partnership with Nike collaborator Jeff Staple. The lawsuit alleges a number of trademark infringement claims based centrally on the fact that, well, I mean, they look almost identical to Nike's classic dunks and they prominently display a stylized version of the Nike swoosh on the side. So the central question of the lawsuit is going to be whether or not the average consumer would find the Warren Lotus shoes to be confusingly similar to the Nike dunks. I don't know, what do you guys think? Looking at the Warren Lotus, would you think that those were put out by Nike? Or would you maybe be confused as to whether or not those were put out by Nike? Let us know in the comments. Anyway, in a further development, on October 19th, Nike also filed a motion for a preliminary injunction against Warren Lotus. 
And if you've seen previous videos of ours from the Epic Games via Apple Saga, you probably also know that a preliminary injunction is basically where the plaintiff asks the court to force the defendant either to stop doing something or to force the defendant to affirmatively do something. In this case, Nike's asking the court to force Warren Lotus to not move forward with the release of the new shoe. This was in response to Warren Lotus releasing a number of Instagram posts last week to reassure consumers who had pre-ordered the allegedly infringing sneakers. In those posts, they had stated that, quote, as of now, both releases will be fulfilled as promised. So as a result of that, Nike is put on high alert. They don't want these Warren Lotus sneakers to be out on the market because consumers will be confused and their trademark might get diluted. So that's why they're filing this motion for a preliminary injunction. Note that in order to win on a motion for a preliminary injunction, Nike will have to show four elements, which include the argument that they're likely to succeed on the merits and that they're likely to suffer irreparable harm. As I've mentioned before in previous videos, it's really tough to win on a motion for a preliminary injunction. But given how similarly these two brands' shoes look and how likely they are to confuse the average consumer, I think Nike might just win on this issue. Okay, so moving on, on October 20th, a judge in Los Angeles County Superior Court dismissed the lawsuit of one of two men who alleged that Michael Jackson sexually abused them as boys. Both plaintiffs, James Safechuck and Wade Robson, appeared in the HBO documentary Leaving Neverland, and they each filed separate lawsuits. The case that was dismissed this week was Safechuck v. MJJ Productions, Inc. and MJJ Ventures, Inc. It alleged six causes of action, namely intentional infliction of emotional distress, breach of fiduciary duty, and four different types of negligence claims. The court here dismissed the plaintiff's third amended complaint on the grounds that the plaintiff didn't plead enough facts connecting the two corporations to the actions of Michael Jackson. Note that when a court dismisses a complaint, they dismiss it either with leave to amend or without leave to amend. If the court dismisses it with leave to amend, it means that the plaintiff can come back and file an amended complaint. Given that this is the plaintiff's third amended complaint, the court ostensibly had already allowed the plaintiff to go back and resubmit a new complaint three times. It's common for courts to give a lot of leeway to a plaintiff to cure issues in the complaint because courts usually prefer the winner in any case to win on the merits rather than on procedure. That said, courts do become increasingly impatient with issues that persist through each new amended complaint. And when it comes down to a third amended complaint, courts often will dismiss without leave to amend, which means they're done. They can't keep resubmitting, the case is just dismissed. And that's actually what happened here. The court dismissed the complaint without leave to amend. So one of the two lawsuits is basically pretty much dead in the water. Mr. Robson's lawsuit, on the other hand, appears to still be ongoing at the moment. Okay, so I've been trying to keep these all short, but the last one I know is of increasing interest on the internet, so I'm going to give it a little bit more substantive treatment. I'll try not to get too deep into the details, but I want to explain a little more because there are a lot of opinions out there on this. In the gaming world this week, Twitter was set on fire when on October 22nd, the senior creative director at Google Stadia, Alex Hutchinson, tweeted out about gaming streamers concerned about losing their content due to copyright infringement under the DMCA or the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Specifically, he had two main tweets. The first one said, streamers worried about getting their content pulled because they used music they didn't pay for should be more worried about the fact that they're streaming games they didn't pay for as well. It's all gone as soon as publishers decide to enforce it. Then he followed up with another tweet that said, the real truth is a streamer should be paying for the developers and publishers of the games they stream. They should be buying a license like any real business and paying for the content they use. This definitely touched a nerve in the gaming community where streaming games has become commonplace and where there's a growing number of content creators that make their money on Twitch and YouTube by streaming their gameplay. The unfortunate truth here is that Mr. Hutchinson is actually more or less correct. I don't want to say that I agree that gaming streamers should be paying developers in order to stream their gaming, but Anytime you buy a creative work, like a book or a movie or a TV show, you're not buying it like you're buying a couch or some other random object where you end up owning it completely and you can do whatever you want with it. You're really buying a piece of it. Specifically, creative works all have some measure of copyright protection, unless they've been around long enough that the copyright protections have expired. And so when you buy that movie, album, TV show, or video game, what you're really buying is the ability to use and enjoy it for yourself. When you buy a physical copy, you have the ability to resell it, but that's only for the physical copies of these things. When it comes to a digital download, you don't necessarily have the right to gift or resell your digital copy. And when it comes to a public performance of copyrighted materials, you also need to get a license for that as well. If you wanna show a movie at a public venue, you typically need a license for that. The same is true for playing music at a public venue. Now, a lot of people responded to Mr. Hutchinson with, well, what about fair use? 
Fair use is a defense that creators can use when they take a copyrighted work and turn it into what's called a transformative use, meaning that they've changed it enough by turning it into some kind of educational tool, social critique, satire, or for purposes of reporting the news, etc., that they essentially have turned it into something entirely different. Think, for example, about how the movie Spaceballs is a lot like Star Wars, but that's intentional and it's kosher because the whole point is to make fun of the Star Wars franchise. The same is true of movies like Not Another Teen Movie or Scary Movie. Now, when it comes to streaming video games, this sort of weird gray area has emerged. On the one hand, streamers are doing public performances of video games, and so technically they should be paying some kind of license for it. When people argue that game streaming is fair use because everyone plays the game differently, that may or may not hold up in a court of law. Game streaming can probably be most closely compared to YouTube reaction videos, where a content creator is sitting in the corner of the video and they're watching a video that takes up the rest of the screen in the reaction video, and the viewer watches both at the same time. Some reaction videos are transformative, but others aren't. It's so highly fact specific that you can't just say that all reaction videos or all game streaming is transformative to the extent that it counts as fair use. But on the other hand, it's not really in anyone's business interest to enforce the requirement that gaming streamers get a license for each game that they stream. And this was highlighted in a tweet by Ryan Watt, Google's global head of gaming for YouTube, who said, we believe that publishers and creators have a wonderful symbiotic relationship that has allowed a thriving ecosystem to be created, one that has mutually benefited everyone. YouTube is focused on creating value for creators, publishers, and users. All ships rise when we work together. And on top of that, a spokesperson for Google actually ended up positioning Google away from Mr. Hutchinson's tweets, saying that the recent tweets by Alex Hutchinson do not reflect those of Stadia, YouTube, or Google. Referring to Mr. Watt's tweet, the way the symbiotic relationship works is like this. The streamers obviously make money off of streaming. In turn, streaming platforms like Twitch and YouTube also make money. And the developers also benefit because game streaming produces free marketing for the developers. So to say that developers don't benefit from game streaming is a little bit ludicrous. So basically, yes, Mr. Hutchinson is technically correct here about the DMCA, but at this point in time, it looks like no one has any business interest in actually enforcing it. So as for gaming streamers that are building businesses on stream platforms, is there a risk that they're building castles on top of sand that can erode from under them? Yes, absolutely. But the erosion will likely come when it's no longer in either the developers or the streaming platform's business interests to encourage game streaming. I would say to people that are building these businesses, just know that there is a risk that the law could start being enforced as soon as that change starts happening and try to prepare for that as best as you can. Okay guys, so that's it for today. Thanks so much for listening into today's edition of Legal Bytes Newscast. We hope you found this interesting and informative, and if you did, we'd love it if you could hit the like button, leave a comment, and share the video. It really does help us grow as a channel. And if there are any areas of law that you particularly wanna hear about, we're all ears for feedback on this, so let us know in the comments. Otherwise, if you haven't already, consider subscribing to our channel so you can see more of our stuff. We're aiming to continue uploading videos twice a week now in our efforts to bring you guys more content. So if you like the news cast or if you like our other deep dive videos, you might want to subscribe so you can get them when we upload. Anyway, until the next video. See you guys soon.